on all sorts of things. Man, we've had a, a couple of incredible weeks. Uh, Randy talked about a few things that have happened around here. I just want to add to that list. Uh, my office has been getting stacked and piled with all sorts of gifts that have been coming in for the teachers. Um, it is so cool. For those of you who took a slip and you went and bought a gift for a teacher, thank you. I, we're really excited. We're going to be sending those out on Tuesday. So could you do me a favor? I don't know if you uh, have ability to remind yourself on a phone or something like that. Somehow make a reminder for yourself to stop sometime during your day on Tuesday and pray over all of our teachers in this community. Teachers are, <laughs> they're doing incredible work with our kids. And uh, as someone who is in the public school system for a long time, my wife who is still in the school system, um, I realize and I recognize it's an incredibly difficult job at times. And we're sending these gifts out, not just to give something to somebody, but to actually be a blessing in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So take some time, if you can remember, on Tuesday just to pray over those gifts. Pray over the teachers who are going to receive them. Pray over the students who are going to be using them. And thank you for jumping in on that with us. Thank you also for last weekend. I don't know what y'all did, but you bought like $1,000 worth of muffins last week uh, from the young ladies who were raising funds for um, buying some things for the Christmas tree. That's a lot of muffins, man. That was cool. Like, and so thank you for uh, participating. And of course, thanks to the, to the young and Auckland Rider family girls who were, uh, who just felt the call to do something uh, cool for the Lord. Um, we had our wild game feed last night. Let me see a show of hands of the men who came. It was an incredible. We had a couple hundred guys in this room, and it was awesome. I want to say thanks to our men's ministry team who put that on. Matter of fact, could we give a round of applause to all our guys who put that thing on. That was an incredible amount of work, an incredible evening, and, uh, and uh, I mean, people kicked in. I don't know how many pies we had, but I did, let me just put this little qualifier or quantifier on it. It was too many for us to eat. Well, that's, a, that's an amazing statement with a bunch of guys in the room, okay? So thank you for everybody who helped out with um, setting up and who brought food last night, who brought pies who uh, cleaned up afterwards. It was a big job to get this place ready like this. Um, and so thank you for uh, being part of that. It was really an incredible, incredible night. And then finally, before we jump in, um, I just want to say a big thanks to Joey Haug. There he is back there. Could we say thanks to Joey? No, you're right there. Uh, for the message last weekend. Um, he always just brings the word, and he, I, every time I sit with, under his teaching, I am challenged and convicted. Um, I was reminded, because uh, one of the, my favorite things to do used to be as I sat underneath a pastor and listened, was to um, guess what the fill-ins were going to be before he actually got to them. Does anybody do that to me? Oh, yeah, that's right. I'm talking about that. I was, like, trying to fill them out. I got a couple right, I just got to say. So that was fun. Um, anyway, it's a great sermon. All right. We are going to be in Psalm 133 and 134. You can go ahead and turn there. This is our last day in the Psalms of Ascent. Um, I know, sad as it is. Don't worry, though. Great things are coming. I'm really excited about this next thing. Uh, you can go to that next slide. We're going to start just getting, getting us ready for Christmas, of course, coming right around the corner. Next week, I'm going to jump into a little sermon series that's called uh, Present Presence. And what I, what I thought would be interesting to do is to trace the presence of God from the very beginning. So in the tabernacle, as he gets you know, moved all around through the desert to his new home in the temple, the presence of God in the Holy of Holies. And then uh, Jesus comes onto this planet and he starts walking around and he literally is Emmanuel, God with us. And that's going to be um, Christmas Eve. And then uh, we're going to look at the present presence of God in us through his Holy Spirit. And so I thought it'd be kind of interesting just to look at the presence of God through these different forms. He's been with us from the beginning, but the way that he is present and the place that he is present actually has changed through history. So um, present presence, we're starting that next week. Uh, looking forward to that. All right, let's finish with the final two Psalms of Ascent. We're going to start with 133. I'm actually just going to read Psalm 134. I'm going to camp out for the entire time in 133. I am going to get into your business a little bit today, um, which is fun for me, maybe not so much for you, um, but Psalm 133, our second to last Psalm of Ascent, is another Psalm of David. So let's go ahead and read that. 
Behold, David says, David writes, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like precious oil on the head running down the beard on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. 134, come bless the Lord, all the servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. And in return, may the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. So we'll go, we'll go back into uh, Psalm 133, David's psalm. He's talking about uh, the blessing of unity among the saints, among brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, I've talked a, a lot about the importance of unity. I, I think it's kind of one of those things, like I said a couple of weeks ago, about hope. I, I don't think you can talk about this one enough, especially in this day and age. I think the unity of the body of believers is becoming more and more critical. We can no longer afford to be divided from our brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm just telling you that not, not only within this church, but in amongst the churches, amongst the larger body of Christ in this community, in this nation. Honestly, we need to find a way to be unified because the attacks of the enemy are getting stronger and stronger. And if we can't come together as the people of God. Um, we are going to be picked off one, one by one. And so David is talking about unity. Um, he's describing unity being like the oil that is running down, running down the beard of Aaron, which is kind of this strange image. Uh, you, you know who Aaron is, right? Um, Aaron was Moses' older brother. Um, he's played a really critical role during the Exodus. He uh, becomes Moses' spokesman, so to speak. Moses wasn't an overly articulate dude. And so Aaron was the one who spoke uh, for him. Um, he has quite a legacy. One of the things that he is responsible for is gathering all of the jewelry that was melted down so that we could create, so that the Jews could create the golden calf, right? And this is one of Aaron's, uh, Aaron's big things. But God uh, sees through that. He repents of that. And God al- allows him to go on to become really the very first high priest. And he is the first high priest in a long line of priests. As a matter of fact, the, the priests in the, in the lineage of Aaron are going to serve in the temple all the way up until the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D., all his um, offspring, all of his, his lineage. So despite the golden calf incident and a, a few others, um, Aaron has actually quite, quite a legacy. And David is referring to his anointing. Um, when they would pour oil onto the head of Aaron and the oil would just run down. And it, not only would it run down his beard and in the collar of his robes, but it would actually run down through all the priests who would serve in his lineage. So David was the first, but every priest after him would be anointed with oil. And that anointing was a passing down. It was a covering of God, right? Um, I'll never forget being uh, in Ecuador. I served with a a little organization called Youth World when I was a youth pastor, and we brought a group of students down to Ecuador. And I had an opportunity to speak at this little Ecuadorian church. And uh, the first thing I learned is it's really hard to speak through a translator. I I would talk, 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 and forget. And this guy's like tapping me on the shoulder, stop, I need to translate. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, But at the end of the service, the pastor of the church uh, came up to me, and he said, I want to pray over you, and I want to anoint you with oil. And so I'm standing there, and, and he's praying over me. They've laid, they'll, some elders from the church laid hands on me, and I was standing there. And he's going to anoint me with oil. I thought he was going to be kind of polite like we are here in the United States. And, you know, a little dabble do ya, you know, brill cream. It's like, <laughs> just need a little bit. This guy, he takes this whole bottle. It's Johnson's and Johnson's baby oil. And he just like, like all over the top of my head. And it just runs down my face underneath my glasses. And it's running down. It's in the corners of my mouth. And I put my head back. And it's like going down my back and into crevices. Anyway, we won't get I don't know. It was, it was legit. It was a little unexpected. But I'll tell you what. It was, um, it was a really powerful experience. It was even thinking about it to this day, I think of how powerful that was when that guy annoyed. It was a, no pun intended, it was a, like a full blown immersive experience. Um, we don't really anoint people with oil like that anymore. We, we kind of uh, are a little more tame. I don't know, maybe we should. David says, It's like the precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. 
Verse 3, he says, It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing life forevermore. So Mount Hermon um, is the highest, was the highest mountain in Israel when it was in Israel. Um, right now it's to the north, just on the Syria-Lebanon border. And it is the only place in the region where you can snow ski. And there's a lot of, uh, it's really high, I think it's like 9,000, 9,200 feet. Um, and uh, during the summer, these streams flow down from the heights of Mount Hermon, and they will make their way all the way down into the Jezreel Valley, and really that's where the, one of the main crop productions, and that, those streams will nourish those crops, and they will all in turn uh, feed all of, honestly, all of, all of Israel. Uh, so there's this, there's this image that David is trying to give us. He says it's like, it's like this flowing down, this covering, this coating, this nourishing on the beard of Aaron, um, water from the heights of Mount Hermon. What is David trying to describe? This is a description of how good it is when we dwell in unity. When we come together in unity, behold how good and pleasant it is when the brothers dwell in unity. Um, I, I've talked about unity enough. I was going back through several sermons and I have a bunch of different sermons on unity. And so I'm going to just hit a couple of really important points um, because I want to uh, jump in on something else, a big component of unity. But the first three fill-ins are going to come really, really quickly. Matter of fact, if you're one of the people who likes to fill in ahead of time, this is your moment, man. You're going to shine right here. Number one, our unity brings covering and nourishment and legacy. Our unity brings covering and nourishment and legacy. We are better together. We, we cover each other. We nourish each other. And through our unity, we have a legacy in, in God. Unity, I like to think of, it's kind of like a badge that we slap on that actually proves our identity in Christ. And so, as a matter of fact, that's number two. Our, our, identi- our unity, unity again, um, identifies us as Christians, John says, or Jesus says in John 13, 34, he says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. And then he says, by this, like this is the thing that people are going to use to know whether or not you're my follower. This is the thing. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Our unity and our love is a mark of our faith. It is a sign of our faith. And then it goes even further than that. And this is like a little quick condensing of of several sermons. But the third one is our unity is a witness to the truth of Jesus. Our unity is a witness to the truth of Jesus. Jesus prays in John chapter 17 in the high priestly prayer. He says that that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you that they also may be in us so that the world may know that you sent me. Right? Isn't that, you stop and think about that for just a second. That's a really amazing statement that people are going to know that God sent Jesus to this planet because of our unity, because of our unity in him and our unity with each other. That's going to be a sign. It's going to be a testament to the, to the grace of God so that the people outside of the church, they look at the church and they see something different here. I've said this before. Man, if the community of Christian faith doesn't stand out in contrast to this world, then why would anybody want to be a part of it? Why would anybody look at us and say, man, I don't, I don't need that. If we're not different, why would someone want to leave what they have to be a part of something that is just as toxic? that is just as destructive. Why would they want to do that? Our unity is a witness to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'll tell you what right now, man. I'm, I am I'm so encouraged by this moment in the life of this church. I'm telling you, I, I don't know. I've been in church long enough to know it's not always like this. It's not always like this. We are remarkably unified we're not perfect. I'm not saying that we're perfect. We have issues. Um, but it's not, always, it's not always like this in this church. There's something happening here at Crossroads, maybe even you could say here in this valley that is just, it's different. I don't know. Can you, can you feel? I don't know. I, I, don't, I hesitate to ask because then somebody's going to be like, I don't feel it. No, you know, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> But I think you can. I think people, I think people can feel it. And you want to be a part of it. 
You want to be a part of it. This is what David said. It's like refreshing how good and how pleasant it is when we dwell in unity. That's not to say that we don't have our hurts. It's not to say we don't have our injuries. We do. We carry all that around, our offenses. We carry our pain with us. But what I've seen, and I've seen this several times, even in just the last, I don't know, maybe six months, I've seen this several times. I've seen this softness of heart um, where we are willing to forgive each other, where we're willing to set aside our own lives, our own preferences, our own desires um, for the sake of unity. And that's kind of where I want to camp out today. I want to camp out on this idea of forgiveness as a critical component in unity. In fact, let's start there. Number four on your outline, it's not the word unity. So if you filled in unity again, sorry. (laughs) Forgiveness is a heartbeat of unity. Um, Without forgiveness, unity is impossible. Let me tell you why. Because there isn't a one of us who is perfect. Without forgiveness, unity is impossible. Why? Because every single one of us has issues. There is no one perfect. Matter of fact, I say this before. If you are are perfect, you better get out fast because we're going to mess you up. We're going to mess you up here at this church. Not like beat you up. I I realized as I said that, that came out. We're going to mess you up. No, I mean, we're just going to corrupt you because we're we're not perfect. We're like a, a... we all, have our, we all have our issues. You cannot talk about Jesus. You cannot talk about his ministry without talking about forgiveness. It is the center point of his ministry because he came into a broken world. He came into a fallen world. All of us are sinners. And it was, what does the scripture say? While we were still sinners, that's when God sent his son to us, right? That's the, that's the world Jesus stepped into. Now listen, I, I kind of hinted at this a little earlier when we were talking about communion. The, the church is really good at these truisms and cliches when, it talks, when we talk about forgiveness. Um, but I want to I get us deeper than that. I want to dig deep and maybe try to root out some things that have set uh, themselves into our souls. So I want to get a little deeper. I am going to be walking on some thin ice for a little while here. You'll see that as soon as I start talking about it. Um, but walk with me. We'll get back to uh, solid ground as soon as I can. Let me start with this. Have you noticed, speaking about forgiveness, have you noticed how our culture is currently dealing with forgiveness? Um, Right now, it really does seem like, and if you pay attention, you watch the news, you watch things that are going on in the world, you really see that there are people who are actively, actually opposed to forgiveness. Not just opposed to it, they are vocally opposed to forgiveness. And I, I think there's actually some really compelling arguments as to why they are opposed to forgiveness. I'll give you a couple of quick cultural snapshots here, give you a feeling for what I'm talking about. Um, we have all been witness to the, to the racial tension in our country. Oh, yeah, here we go. Walking on the thin ice. Here we go. Um, you may remember uh, 2015, a group of African Americans wa- were in a Bible study, I think it was, at Emmanuel Episcopal Church in um, Charleston, South Carolina, and a shooter came into the building and uh, shot them. Remember this? There were nine people who were killed. Um, he, was a, he was a white supremacist. Shortly after that, um, because of their faith, really, the families of some of the people who were killed came together, and they said publicly, they went on the news, they publicly said, we forgive you to the shooter, to the gunman. It was shortly after that that this article came out in the Washington Post. It was, um, it said, um, black America should stop forgiving white racists. Now listen, there's a part of me that reacts in a certain way viscerally to that headline. But there's another part of me that really understands that. I, I can understand why someone would want to write that article. And here's why. Because a lot of times, forgiveness looks like injustice. Forgiveness looks like injustice. So that spawned this outcry. Let me go to an, oh, another one here. You remember Amber Geiger? Remember her? She was a police officer. This was like 2018, just a few years ago. She uh, was a police officer. She walks into her apartment 
Well, it wasn't her apartment. Remember, she thought it was her apartment. She walks into her apartment, what she thought was her apartment, and there's a guy sitting there, and a, bl- a black guy sitting there, and she pulls out her service pistol, and she thinks it's an intruder, and she shoots him, kills him. Um, his name was Botham Jean. Um, Botham was killed because she walked into the wrong apartment. So she goes on, there's this kind of long, drawn-out trial. People watch the trial. And um, she's eventually sentenced to 10 years in uh, prison. She's eventually sentenced to 10 years in prison. Um, at her sentencing, Botham Jean's brother, his name was Brant Jean, and some of you may have seen this, um, he got up and publicly forgave her. I'm going to show you the little clip from that video. I don't want to say twice or for the hundredth time what you've or how much you've taken from us. I think you know that. But I just... I hope you go to God with all what, all the guilt all the, thing, the bad things you may have done in the past, each and every one of us may have done something that we're not supposed to do. If you truly are sorry, I know I can speak for myself. I, I forgive you. And I know if you go to God and ask him, he will forgive you. Um, shortly after that, this article came out. Uh, It's called The Insanity of White Justice and Black Forgiveness. And the byline, the tagline for the article was, reducing another tragic loss of black life to a Hallmark card is not justice. See, you see this trend in our culture right now. It says forgiveness is is a lack of accountability. Forgiveness is a lack of justice. If you forgive then you can't have justice. And it's not just racial issues. Let me tell you one more. Um, in 1984, there was a 13-year-old girl. Um, her name was Candace Dirksen, and she was abducted on her way home in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Abducted on her way home. Her parents launch one of the largest searches. Their names were Wilma and Cliff Dirksen. There's a picture of the two of them. Launch one of the largest searches. Um, they don't find her. Well, they don't find her for seven weeks. Um, eventually, they do find her. She was in a shed. She was bound and frozen to death. Um, the day that Cliff and Wilma learned of their daughter's death, they met another man whose daughter had been murdered some years earlier. It was evident as they listened to him that he had been consumed by his grief and by his anger and that it had ruined his life. And so we made a decision that night, Wilma wrote years later, that we would respond differently, and we chose the path of forgiveness. The next day at the press conference, when the reporter asked us what we thought of the offender, we replied that our intention was to forgive. They met with horrified responses. When she joined Family Survivors of Homicide, Wilma was told in no uncertain terms to stop talking about forgiveness because it was wrong, both socially and emotionally. Some said that they could have not have really loved their daughter Candace if they could forgive her murderer. Others said that their forgiveness was creating a more dangerous society in which violent criminals would not be held accountable. Um, I'll just say that historically, they're not totally wrong. Uh, there have been times when forgiveness has been used as a means of control, as a means to excuse sin, as a means to avoid justice, as a means to manipulate. Forgiveness can seem like letting the perpetrator off the hook, and it has the potential to victimize. There is something so compelling about the argument that our culture is putting forward because it's not, it's not totally wrong. 
There's something inside of all of us that understands that. That is why our culture is so opposed to forgiveness. Someone wrote an article that said, to hell with the forgiveness culture. We're done with the forgiveness culture because grace is seen as weakness. It is seen as is mocked. Revenge is what is really celebrated. And listen, sometimes this kind of thinking sneaks into our thinking. We be, just be honest with me here for a second. We struggle with these same kind of thoughts about forgiveness. If you don't struggle with a thought like that, like, wait a second, what about justice? If you don't struggle with a thought like that, man, I don't know, maybe you just haven't had to forgive somebody something that deep. Maybe you haven't, not in the normal modern sense of the world, but maybe you haven't been a real victim in a long time. Because when you're a victim of something that is horrific and somebody tells you to forgive, every part of you, this goes against every part of our sense of justice to forgive. It, It feels like we're letting somebody off the hook. So what are we supposed to do with this? How are we supposed to navigate this if we're talking about, oh, unity in the church? You know, wait, yeah, but what about real hurt? What about real pain? What about real wrongs that people have committed? And listen, I'm not just talking about headlines. Those are all these big forgiveness moments that maybe make the news. But I'm talking about if we're going to live in unity as a church, we need to figure out how to offer little forgivenesses every single day to a myriad of people. Because we all have, we all endure slights, we endure letdowns, we endure frustrations, people who hurt us. Maybe inadvertently, sometimes they don't even really know what they've done and they've hurt us. Sometimes it's it's more malicious than that. Maybe it's actually intentional. It might not be to the degree of murder, but it feels like it when somebody hurts you that bad and somebody comes along and says, forgive, and you're like, I don't want to hear that. And we, we understand the argument that our culture is putting forward because uh, we've been hurt. We've been stabbed. There's a reason that, um, that we call it being stabbed in the back because <laughs> it feels like that. It feels like that. So I'm reading this book, Tim Keller's new book called Forgive. Um, Actually, I put it here. I'll just read it from here. He says, um, he says, no one can live unless he or she learns when to forgive silently, when to bring the matter up, and how to forgive even if the person is reluctant to admit his or her fault. He says, we cannot love without forgiveness, but we can't live without it either can't live without it either. Um, In the book, he kind of gives us, kind of narrows it down to these three options that we have. What kind of options do we have here as a Christian? I gave them to you on your outline, actually, because I wanted you to think about this. Um, The first uh, idea is just that we just forgive unconditionally, Um, that uh, some people call it cheap grace, that there are no conditions on the forgiveness. There's no consequence for the perpetrator. All the emphasis is on the on the, on the victim being uh, what he calls therapeutically liberated from anger. So we're like, let go of these. So, and you hear this in church. We say this in church a lot. Like, you need to forgive because it's hurting you. It is destroying you. And so there's a sense of like, the best thing for you to do, you don't, don't, we're not concerned with justice right now, but the best thing for you to do is to forgive. It's good for you. It's good for you. So that's one, one idea. It's called uh, forgive unconditionally. And then I'm going to jump to number three, which is on the other end of the spectrum, is just to not forgive at all. We're just going to leave forgiveness aside and we are going to favor justice. In the middle of these two seems something that seems like a compromise where it is um, called forgive transactionally, which means that what we do then is we, we wait for the perpetrator to merit forgiveness. So have they done enough penance? Have they done, uh, suffered enough? Have they gone through enough that we can forgive uh, them? It says um, forgiveness depends on the perpetrator meriting forgiveness. Victim gives up its anger, his anger, her anger, only if there is sincere repentance or, or reparation. So we, we seem like, well, what, which one of these three? It seems like we only have... Three. Those seem like the only options that we're presented with, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you something else, another option, a fourth option here, and I think this is the most scriptural one that we can find. Um, to get into that, I'll uh, remind you of a story. A uh, story, matter, matter of fact, it's the longest treatment of forgiveness in the entire scripture. It comes to us in Matthew 18, uh, verses 21 to 35. Um, for the sake of time, I won't read it, but you'll probably remember the story. Remember the story of the servant. It's a parable that Jesus tells. A servant who goes and borrows that great sum of money from his master. And uh, it's a a huge amount of money. Jesus says, he says it's 10,000 talents, which when you look at 
uh, commentaries and scholars, they say it's kind of hyperbole. Like it's just a crazy amount of money. Like maybe something close to $4 billion in today's change. So you kind of get a clue for this a crazy amount of money. Um, of course, he can't pay it back. And so the master is going to sell him, sell his wife, sell his kids off into slavery and see if he can recoup some of his loss. But the servant comes to him. And he, remember, he falls down on his knees and he begs the master, I, I can't do it. Please don't do this to me. Please don't. And, and the master actually releases him. The master releases him and he forgives the debt. He says, you know what? Okay, you came to me, you begged forgiveness and you begged me to take, let this go. I'm gonna let this go from you. And you remember the same guy, the, the servant, he goes out and he has somebody else who owes him some money, a much smaller amount. He goes out to the guy and he starts to really berate him and he says, you're gonna pay me and he throws that guy in jail. He says, you're not getting out of jail until you pay me. And some other dudes see this happening and they go back to the original master and they say, hey, you should see what's going on over here. And the, the original master, he is furious. Remember, he's furious with the servant. He says, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have done the same? In his anger... The master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. And Jesus interprets, he says, so also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. So let me just point out a couple of things before we just take this thing all uh, what we normally know about it. The Bible is going to show us this, this fourth option. It, it's not one we like. Matter of fact, we don't talk about it very often. Um, it's called um, costly forgiveness. Uh, let's go back to the psalm for just a second. You remember the oil that was poured out on the head of Aaron that flows down his beard, down his robes? Does anybody remember the descriptor of that oil? What, is it, what does it say about the oil? It is precious. Yeah, it is precious oil. Some translations might say something like costly or valuable. Um, it is something that someone has paid for that is not cheap. It is not cheap. Somebody paid for the oil that is poured out for unity. Somebody paid for that. Number five, biblical forgiveness is costly forgiveness. Nobody likes to talk about this. There is a cost to unity. There is a cost to forgiveness. When we read the parable, we cannot forget what it cost the original master to forgive the debt. We, we kind of overlook that part because we're so focused on the, on the servant. Um, Jesus is, goes to this intentional idea of saying, hey, this is like 10,000 talents, maybe, some, maybe like millions or billions of dollars. The, why, does he, why does he take so much time to make sure, why does he make such a high number? I think maybe because he wants to make sure that we get a sense of the suffering that the master is going to have to endure if he forgives the debt. Right? So you, you say you let someone stay at your house. They don't have insurance. Your house is not insured. They're there while you're gone. They burn the place down to the ground. The house doesn't just rebuild itself. If you say, hey, I'm going to forgive that, if I'm going to let that one go, somebody's going to have to endure the cost. Somebody is going to have to pay for the house to be, to be rebuilt. It doesn't just pay for itself. The one who forgives is the one who pays. We don't say that very often, do we? The one who forgives is the one who pays. There is the cost to the one who forgives. If you have forgiven someone recently, you know what I'm talking about. If you have forgiven someone recently who has done you real damage and real harm, you know what I'm talking about. There is a cost. There is a cost to forgiveness. C.S. Lewis says everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they actually have to do it until they actually have to do it. Listen, it's really important. I think we have to wrap our minds around this, and I'll tell you why it's important as we go on. Forgiveness is almost a form, and I think I can stand on the scriptures and say this, but I'd welcome some comment if you disagree. Forgiveness is almost a form of voluntary suffering. We, we bear the cost of forgiveness when we forgive. A guy named Andre Peterson uh, he said, I asked a few people if they'd ever forgiven anyone and what it felt like. They gave me answers so pious, I knew they'd never done it. Forgiveness is a brutal transaction done with fully engaged faculties. It's my pain instead of yours. I eat the debt. I absorb the misery I wanted to dish out on you. It was an extraordinary cost for the master 
to forgive the debt. What is Jesus saying here? here? I'll tell you what he's saying. Because he knew exactly what God paid. Jesus is saying it was an extraordinary cost for God to cancel our debt. Okay? You know what it cost. Every person has a good church answer, but I want this to sink in. It cost him his son. That's what he paid to cover our sin. That's what he paid to pay our debt. It cost him his son. Do not miss the confrontational nature of this parable. This guy comes and he begs. He begs for forgiveness and it is granted to him, not just on a whim, it is granted to him at the highest of costs. And listen, he is completely unchanged by it. It is given to him at the highest of cost. He's completely unchanged. The, the hypocrisy, when we read the parable, is so obvious to us. What a jerk. He'd go then and be mean to some other guy that owes him some piddly little amount of money. But then when we're wrong, everything inside of us wants the offender to suffer. We want that to happen. Tim Keller Forgiveness means that when we want to make them suffer, instead you refuse to do it, and this refusal is hard. It is difficult and it is costly because through it you are absorbing the debt for yourself. The only, under, the only way for us to understand this, us dwelling together in unity, us to understand what it means to forgive each other is to understand what we have been forgiven vertically. If we can't wrap our minds around what God did to forgive us, then this doesn't make any sense. Then of course we're not gonna dwell together in unity. Why would I forgive someone else if I have no understanding of what God did for me on that cross through his son Jesus Christ? If I don't get that, then this doesn't make sense. The horizontal thing doesn't make sense. That's why Paul writes in Colossians chapter three, he says, bear with one another and if you have a complaint against another, forgiving each other, listen, as the Lord, it's like a reminder of the vertical. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Number six on your outline, human forgiveness depends on divine forgiveness every time. Every single time. It does not make any sense otherwise. If we can't understand the vertical, if we can't understand the depth, if we can't understand the debt that was absorbed by God, then we will never understand the horizontal. Listen, going back to where I started this whole message, this is what is going to set us apart from this world. Our culture does not understand forgiveness because they don't understand what it meant for God to forgive us. Our culture does not understand forgiveness because they don't understand what it meant for God to forgive us. If you're, if you're here today and you, you haven't received the forgiveness of God through Jesus Christ, then this is going to sound like foolishness. This is just ridiculous. Like, why would we, why would we ever do that? Because here's God, and all of a sudden he's offering all this, this free grace and this free mercy and this free forgiveness. All of it's free, and there's no, there's no strings attached to it. He pays the entire day. He pays the entire thing. It's yours for the believing, but never, never assume that it didn't cost God something, that it didn't cost God something to forgive us. Forgiveness is more and more countercultural because our culture is more and more counter-God. This sets the church apart. This is something different. And yeah, I'm just going to be the first to admit to you, it is going to cost us something. It is going to cost us something. We give up the things that this world offers freely. We give up our anger. We give up our hatred. We give up our, our revenge. And those are not easy for us to give up. This is why Jesus calls us and he says, hey, do you want to be a follower? Yes, Jesus, I do. Okay, pick up your cross and follow me. We've, we've reduced that to some little cliche. This is what it looks like. And for those of you who have struggled with pain, who are victims, those of you who have struggled with real hurt and real injury, you know exactly how difficult it is. You know exactly what I'm talking about. might seem a little trivial, 
but the unity that results from our ability to do this for each other, it's like water flowing down from the mountains, which doesn't sound like a big deal unless you're wandering around in a desert with nothing to drink, and then you understand how precious it is, how important it is. If you have someone to forgive, can I just encourage you, just do not delay. I know, I know, I have no clue about the depth of what I'm asking. I know a few stories. I don't know all the stories, but I understand the depth of what I'm I'm asking. But there is something sacred about your release. There is something sacred about the forgiving of the debt. Philip Yancey says, by forgiving another, I am trusting God to be a better justice maker than I am. If you don't know um, what it means to forgive or how to forgive, you don't know how to go through that process. I tried to give you a couple of outline uh, on your outline. There's a couple of resources for you, some books, including this one from Tim Keller, which is amazing. Um, if you have not received the forgiveness of God through Jesus Christ, if you have not absorbed that, taken that into your life, then again, this isn't going to make any sense. But can I encourage you today just to not delay with that? to receive what God has freely given you. It is the most powerful, most life-changing thing that you can do. It's, a, it's kind of a simple prayer. It's, it's a, just an admission in humility that you need the forgiveness. And then you're, you're believing that Jesus is the answer to that, that he is the one who is going to offer you forgiveness and you, you turn your life over to him. That that step is absolutely critical. If you're looking around at you and all these horizontal plane, you're looking around at all the people you need to forgive and you don't know how to even start, I'm going to tell you right now, it starts in your relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the first thing you have to understand. God has something better for us than this world has to offer. But it means that we are going to have to die before we can truly live. I don't want to be a pastor who stands up here and tickles your ears and makes sure that everything is candy-coated so that it can go down smoothly and easily. This is brutal what God is asking us to do. It is absolutely brutal. But there is so much freedom on the other side of just believing Him and allowing Him to be the one who does the justice. Amen? Amen. I'm going to pray uh, a, a song of praise at the end here, a benediction, and it's going to be Psalm 134, which is what I started with. Um, if you wouldn't mind just uh, bowing your heads, and let me, let me pray and close this out today. The benediction prayer, Psalm 134, the last of the Psalms of the Ascent, says, Come, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord who stand by night in the house of the Lord, lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. God, I pray that your blessing would rain down. I realize even as I spoke today, it sank in deeper and deeper just the depth of what you're asking of us. And this is so anti-countercultural. It is so against the grain But you have set this church apart. You have set your church apart to be different in this world. And the only way that we're going to be different is by doing the things that you have called us to do. God, our, our sense of justice sometimes is just so rocked by this idea of forgiveness. And it makes sense because we feel like we're letting people off the hook. But God, you're taking care of that. You are taking care of that. It doesn't mean that there aren't consequences and there should be. There should be consequences in this culture, in this society for people who who break the law, who hurt other people. God, as, as far as we are concerned, as far as we are concerned, we are going to commit to forgiving each other. And the unity that results, God, the unity that that brings is precious. It's precious. <sighs> Give us strength. Thanks for this time together today. Lord, I love you. Amen.
and uh, we want to follow you, and we're ready to pick up the cross and do it. We pray all this through your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.